What are we doing in Chicago? Or oh, trading away Justin Fields to start with. <laughs> Which, trade Justin Fields for a two. That'd be awesome if they get a two for him. Is there any world where you keep Fields and you keep Caleb Williams? I don't think there's much value in that. But other people are pitching it as a concept. Yeah. Most people that pitch that as a concept don't know ball. Though. Don't know ball. They don't well, you're know. always – you've. this has been your, like, approach. I don't know What's ball. the touchy-feely yeah, thing? Yeah, I like, don't know what's ball. What's the point? You keep them in. No, you know, I, would, I would compete. I would consider it. I mean, if I can get a two for fields, I'd probably be like, all right, fine. I'm going Caleb Williams and two for fields. Let's go. Um, I don't hate the idea of keeping both. I see so. no benefit to keeping both. Like, yeah, I know you if, you've, if you've made the decision that you're drafting Caleb Williams, assuming it's him, number one overall, you've also made the decision that Justin Fields isn't good enough to be that guy. Like, all you're doing, if it turns out he is, is making his life more difficult by bringing in his replacement. And, like, the, the absolute best-case scenario for this is you sort of fall into some kind of Joe Montana, Steve Young mesh thing and without any of the, like, the ways of that working in terms of, like, salary cap and stuff from back in the day. Like, you just stumble ass backwards into this, like, quarterback competition that galvanizes the guy you already had at which point you probably could have done that without spending the number one overall pick on his replacement. It just, it, it just feels bad from a process standpoint to me. I am, even as a, you know, uncover every rock for your next, next quarterback, I am perfectly fine with declaring Caleb Williams the guy that we're building around and moving on from Justin Fields. Good. So let's do that as a starting point. If you can get a two for him, great. If, even if it's a three, I'm still probably doing it. Um, Best case scenario, we talked with Trevor last week. We talked about best case scenarios for teams in the top 10. The Bears are the only team that have two top 10 picks right now. If a Malik Neighbors falls, I don't know. I don't know if that's possible or not. Everybody's talking about him in the top five or six. But I do wonder if the NFL is going to be a little bit higher on some of the defensive players. And I wonder if some of the tackles go higher, right? The, the, remember last year at this time, we all had Paris Johnson going. 12 14 15 and it's like no he went the the cardinals are ready to take him at three yeah and he wasn't an elite tackle so that if the tackles get pushed up the board or if some of the defensive players get pushed up the board like jared verse is a top 10 caliber player in a lot of drafts i wonder if malik neighbors is there at nine yeah for the bears to me that would be a grand slam man caleb williams plus neighbors or a dunes i would take him too but i think neighbors in particular if he falls to nine yeah i mean I think it's entirely possible that the whichever one of those guys doesn't go first, Neighbors or Odunze, could be available, you know, at the fringes of the top 10. And depending on how you view those two guys, you would think that he, that if, you, if you're a fan of the one that slides, that will seem an absolute bargain. Like Odunze, I think, could be the number one receiver in most draft classes. Um, people are making the same argument about Neighbors as well. Uh, and if you believe that his weakness or his flaw right now is fixable, then he's like a clear number one in almost any draft class out there. So if he's available at nine, you'd be like, hell yeah. The other interesting thing, as I mentioned about the free agent market before, the receivers, Higgins, Pittman, Mike Evans, Marquise Brown, Darnell Mooney is listed at six on the free agent market on the PFF uh, free agent board. But... The projected contract from Brad is just one year, nine million. Gabe Davis is the next guy on the board. It's one year, twelve million. It seems like Brad is anticipating what I was kind of talking about before, I, like Jacoby Myers. I I like Jacoby Myers quite a bit as a player, but once you get into like four year and four years, twelve million, four years, fourteen, or Corey Davis a couple of years ago, loved, liked him as a two, but at fifteen, sixteen million a year, don't love that. Right. Is Brad anticipating this kind of market correction for the tier two wide receiver? If that's the case, would Mooney come back to the Bears for something like that? Like if you added a Mooney's the type of guy where he, if he's your three and he's just a you know use your speed get down the field type of guy, that looks great to me. I just don't want him as my two. Um, I wonder if that's an option for the Bears to try to keep him back on another prove it deal. Yeah, absolutely. Possibly. I mean, it's an interesting when you look at the contract projections for these guys. He doesn't have many people at all getting any kind of long term deal from the wide receiver group. Like, right. There's a couple of guys getting more than uh, a, a couple of years. Everyone else is signing for some variety of short term deal, whether it's the franchise tag for a couple right. of the top guys or That's the scarcity simply issue we're talking about. Right. Like the, the, the true wide receiver one does have a massive impact. But the next group they're competing with. 
the Ricky Pearsalls and right. Jalen Polks and the guy and, and Xavier Worthies that we're talking about. And even though those guys are unknown, they're much cheaper. And you could say comparable talent wise, you know, yeah, within and, a year and or two. I think having a sort of transition that's never been easier. I mean, the strike rate now for wide receivers seems incredibly high in the draft. And okay, every now and again you're you're gonna ha- hit one that doesn't have an immediate impact, but look at the number that do. Now, uh, the other big question for Chicago this offseason is Jalen Johnson coming off his career year at corner, 90.8 PFF grade last year, one of the best corners in the league. And they're kind of at a standstill as far as negotiations go. Is he had just a franchise tag? Just a tag and, and figure it out, or are we going to try to lock him up? I mean, I think they'll try and lock him up, but I don't know if they'll get it done. The point being that the Bears are one of the few teams out there where they have a kind of cap space where they just don't – just. It's not a th- – we don't need to think about it. Like, there are teams out there where you're like, God, oh, we really don't want to have to put the franchise tag on this guy. We don't have that kind of flexibility. That's chewing up, you know, almost all of our cap space. Now we can't maneuver. The Bears have enough space where they can slap the franchise tag on them. If they can get a deal worked, worked out, great. If they can't, doesn't matter. We still in, got- in part because they already released guard slash center Cody Whitehair. Right. And uh, safety Eddie Jackson. So they – they saved about $22 million against the cap already. What a fall Those from two. grace, by the way, Eddie Jackson. I mean, both guys, really. I mean, yeah, but, I mean, but yeah, Eddie Jackson for sure. Eddie Jackson had that year where he looked like he was going to be, you know, the next Earl Thomas or whatever, yep. and then never came close to that ever again. Yes. Um, so I think um, I want to see a receiver at nine. I want to see maybe another playmaker added to the mix there as well. Um, not necessarily just Mooney, but you know they've got Mooney hitting free agency. They've got Equinemia St. Brown and you know guys hitting free agency. I want to see another addition there. Jalen Johnson, we tag and bring him back. And then, as we've said for a couple of years now, the Bears rebuild has hit the point where they need to uh, attack with um, enthusiasm unknown to mankind hmm. the defensive line. That's the Jim Harbaugh line. I'm going to attack the day with enthusiasm unknown to mankind. Okay. That needs to be this offseason – when it comes to the Bears and the defensive line. Last year, they spent two draft picks on Gervon Dexter, Zach Pickens. Uh, don't think that means anything as far as uh, there's still a lot more work to do up front. They traded for Montez Sweat. There goes their second-round pick, but they at least have him locked up. Defensive line needs to be probably the biggest focus once we get past those two top 10 draft picks. Yeah, and it, it will be interesting to see what the whether, whether they do lean in free agency with some of the money that they have. You know, we said it's a really good group of sort of capable impact level veteran free agents or whether they they're like we're rebuilding still we're resetting the clock again at quarterback so we're almost sort of you know pushing into the future even more this rebuild project do we just keep going young players and youth and off and then draft rather than actually bringing in some established veterans Bryce Huff will give to everybody Mr. Pass Rush win Good win rate, right? Yeah. Unbelievable pa- pure pass rusher coming from the Jets. Um, Danelle Hunter on the market. You know, do they they just they just made their big splash move at edge rusher, right? I don't um, on our free agent board you've got Josh Allen, the edge from the Jags. I think the Jags are gonna do what they can to to keep him home. Right. Brian Burns, Daniil Hunter, Bryce Huff, Chase Young, Jonathan Grenard. Grenard might be the guy coming off a really good season in Houston. Where you, you might not need to pay him twenty plus million, but you can get him at a decent price, and he'll be a complimentary piece. Uh, Brad has him at three years, sixteen million per year. That feels like a good fit. I'm sure every Bears uh, prognostication has talked about Grenard as this hybrid. You know, not breaking the bank, but really nice addition opposite Montez Sweat. Yeah, that makes some sense. Brian Burns would be interesting. I mean, they're gonna are they gonna tag him again? <laughs> like just keep him, keep him in Carolina, <laughs> having turned down what was it two first round picks that they turned down from the Rams to keep him around. It's a whole and now, new, it's a whole new regime there, though. Yeah, but don't they feel? Doesn't the entire Panthers thing feel like sort of we won't get we won't do the right thing on Brian Burns because we turned down that? Like the whole thing feels like regret that we didn't take yeah. this deal. So now we're not just letting him go. And we're not we're like, we're, we're continuing down the Brian Burns path because we didn't take two first round picks when we had it on the table. Yeah. I mean, I don't know what they end up doing there. It feels like a lot of the Panthers moves, like before they traded uh, Christian McCaffrey was like, let's just keep some star power. 
Huff is the perfect move, though. Like yeah. he he's a guy that will be 26 next season, who's been one of the best uh, situational pass rushers in the NFL. Who last year showed that he can scale that up into a much more of a full time workload. And even if it only, like even if last year represents his ceiling, and as sort of the the optimum role and distribution that you can use him for, when you have a Montez Sweat. And then add you know another player in the draft. That's perfect. Like even if he's that and nothing else, and there's still the chance that he could be more than that. You know, with an even bigger role. Yeah, I think I think for the Bears, does this offseason look? I mean, then we well, have the interior defensive line again is still an issue. They spent the two picks last year. They got a nice year out of Andrew Billings, but interior of the defensive line also needs help. Um, I wonder if this offseason looks a little bit like what the Browns did last year. The Browns went into last offseason with just Miles Garrett. They had been stitching it together for a couple seasons, and then they added the guys we mentioned earlier in the show a while ago, Dalvin Tomlinson and Zadarius Smith and Oba Okoronkwo. One high-priced big guy. Are they in the mix for Justin Matabuike from the Ravens? Are they in the mix for Christian Wilkins from the Dolphins, the one first-rounder from 2019 on the line, a D-line, that hasn't been locked up long-term? I think there's one big splash play in there, plus a Grenard or a Huff, Plus, you know, the bargain basement. I mean, I think there's three, four, five additions that are needed on that defensive line in Chicago to really compete here. Yeah, I, I suspect Wilkins gets franchise tagged. Um, Grover Stewart would be a really interesting one. He's been a ridiculously productive player for the Colts in the interior. Yep. Um, he's a little older, so I'm not sure he fits necessarily a kind of longer term outlook and strategy. And I think then, you want to mix, though, because I think the Bears yeah. can compete. I think they can compete right away, but you also really want to be competing two years from now. The right? one name that keeps jumping out, though, from the interior defensive line free agent group that I'm going to come back to time and time again this offseason is Javon Kinlaw, former first-round pick, really? who was terrible for the first few years of his career. Terrible and injured and terribly injured. Yeah. Um, and then last season, we sort of saw actually look he can make an impact now you know once he's a bit more healthy now really good defensive line around him in a way that isn't going to be the case in Chicago but you at least saw for the first time in his NFL career hey look he can actually make an impact he showed some flashes right for sure. he's only 26 years yeah. old like he does fit that idea of you know in in three years what could this group look like he could be part of that in three years I thought you were going to say Maurice Hurst. No. Currently at number 95 on our board. Um, I think when it comes to defensive line, uh, Bears can get some of those one or two of the high-end guys. Like, they can afford all this. One or two of the high-end guys plus go into the 90s and the 100s right. in, on, our, on our free agent board. The Mike Danas of the world and the Shelby Harris's of the world, the Maurice Hursts of the world. A lot of the guys that the Browns – do what the Browns did last offseason and reshape that defensive line in Chicago.